I recognize Representative Joseph Stephen Paduano. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Speaker, distinguished colleagues, before I begin, I join the whole nation in congratulating weightlifter Hedelin Diaz for winning the country's first ever Olympic gold medal. Ayong laban, buhat mo ang bakal na may bigat na dalawang daang, dalawang put-apat na kilo. Sa iyong panalo, bit-bit mo ang tagumpay ng sambayanang Pilipino. We are proud of you. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I stand before you today to fulfill the constitutionally mandated system of checks and balances. Madam Speaker, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages who care to listen, this is the real state of our nation. We are one of the most challenging times in the Philippine history. We are suffering from terrible heartbreak due to COVID outbreak. Whatever gains we have achieved cannot measure up to the pains we have endured. The loss of lives and livelihood, the economic collapse, and the hard climb to recovery tell us only one thing. This country is in a very bad shape. Madam Speaker, it pains me so much to paint a gloomy picture of our country's situation. But this is the reality that we are facing. On pandemic response, Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, we are in a crisis. The Philippine economy is suffering from a deep recession due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic with the 2020 gross domestic product contracting by 9.6% year on year. This was the largest annual decline ever recorded since 1946 or after the Second World War. Undeniably, we failed to act promptly against the virus threat. And when we did, the infection had already made its way to the different parts of the country. The great blunder we committed at the onset of the pandemic was very closely on the part of the economy. It also made us realize how weak our public health system as we witness the sufferings that our vulnerable population had to go through because of the mistake. In addressing the emerging health problem last, last March 2020, the government relied on harsh and long period of isolation or restrictions to contain the pandemic and apparently miscalculated the tremendous negative effects of lockdown on the lives of the Filipino people and the economy. Obviously, while the lockdown had slowed down the spread of virus, it deprives our people of their income. The economic slowdown caused by the government-imposed lockdown is one of the longest quarantine periods in the whole world, resulted in the shutting down of operations of thousands of small and medium-sized businesses and raised the number of unemployed Filipinos. The data released by the Philippine Statistic Authority indicated that as of May 2021, the, employment, the unemployment rate in the country was estimated at 7.7% or 3.73 million individuals. This statistical data 
demonstrate the government's failure to manage the health crisis without sacrificing the livelihood and economic opportunities for our people. Worse, amid lockdowns, the number of COVID infections in the country had continuously increased. The attempted reopening of the economy in the third quarter of 2020 resulted in the rapid resurgence of the virus, a clear showing of our failure to take advantage of the prolonged lockdown. It must have been used as an opportunity to improve our health facilities and but the recent second wave of the pandemic showed to us the reality that we still don't have enough capacity to handle massive inspections. Madam Speaker, my esteemed colleagues, the Philippines has recorded more than 1.5 million cases of COVID-19 infection with over 27,000 deaths as of July 24, 2021. On the same day last year, the Department of Health reported a total of 76,444 cases with 1,879 deaths. This means that in years' time, COVID-19 infections rose by more than 1.4 million cases with 25,000 deaths. The figures strongly indicate our inefficient and feckless pandemic response that only made survival more complicated for our Kababayans. Now, Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, amid the threat being posed by the Delta variant, the government needs to strengthen the free COVID-19 testing program for people in affected villages and ensure that private testing centers offer affordable price. On the other hand, the financial subsidies provided to Filipino families through the social amelioration program under the Bayanian 1 and 2 were only enough to give them temporary respite from day-to-day -day difficulties. Worse, as our people cope with hunger, the soft distribution was too slow and tainted with allegations of corruption. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, the late declaration of the pandemic, which was admitted by Health Secretary Francisco Duque III, during a congressional hearing has contributed to the worsening public health and economic crisis. And just like adding insult to injury, the benefits due to our frontliners were and are still delayed. Hailed as a modern day heroes, our health workers have been praised, but at the same time, they were threatened with possible demotion to the Department of Budget and Management Circular 20-04. What a shame. Amid the hardship brought about by the pandemic, the resilient Filipinos continued to hope for a better life after COVID. However, the delayed delivery of the vaccines has been hurting their aspirations for a speedy recovery. As of July 2021, five days before President Duterte delivered the State of the Nation address, only 5.5 million Filipinos are fully vaccinated, while 10.8 million others have received their first dose of COVID jobs, according to the DOH report. It is still a long way to go before the government achieve its population protection, the target of which is 58 million people. 
lack of vaccine, vaccine supply impedes the mass inoculation activity. According to Philippine Vaccine Char and OPAP Secretary Carlos Carlito Galvez Jr., who had apologized for the delay in the delivery of the COVID shots. Clearly, low vaccine supply is a problem that we cannot control. Umaasa lang po tayo sa mga vaccine manufacturers, kaya wala po tayong magwa kung kulang o kunti lamang ang ating mabibili na bakuna. Another problem affecting the mass vaccination is the high hesitancy rate among Filipinos. This situation reflects the failure of the Department of Health and local government units and other agencies to convince our people about the benefits of taking the shots. The sluggish vaccine rollout in the country could also be attributed to the delays in the government's decision to procure COVID shots and the approval to, author to authorize LGUs and the private sector to buy their own vaccines. Madam Speaker, Your Honours, another serious concern about the ongoing vaccination is the perceived inequitable distribution of COVID jobs. This was brought up by our colleagues from Mindanao, led by the Honourable Deputy Speaker Rufus Rodriguez during the House hearing last June 14. The disparity in the number of vaccinated individuals between the INSEAR and other regions illustrates the preferential priority of the national government on the mass inoculation and the financial incapability of small and poor LGUs to procure vaccines. Nahirapan ang ang bumili, naghirap palalo sa storage ng bakuna. Ito ang sitwasyon ng maliliit na LGUs, gaya ng nangyayari sa Montinlupa City, kamakailan lang. Ayon kay Secretary Galvez, itinapon ng pamalaan lokal ng Montinlupa ang natitirang bakuna dahil sa takot na nasira ang mga ito. Matapos, nagmalfunction ang storage facility nito. Certainly, small municipalities and provinces need help. But how can they get the much needed assistance if the government is so engrossed with Metro Manila? A balanced distribution of government resources and services between NCR and other regions is necessary if we want the mass inoculation program to succeed. In allocating and distributing the vaccines, dapat din isang alang isa alang alang ng pamalaan ang naging epekto ng balik provincia program na naging daan o pamakauwi sa mga lalawigan ang ating mga kababayan. Dagdag parito libo libo ng mamayan ang napilita ng umuwi sa provincia dahil sila ay nawalan ng kabuhayan. Ang ating pag-asa ay nakasalalay sa bakuna. Kaya mga kababayan, habang wala pang bakuna para sa lahat, ang panawaga, panawagan ng minorya ay iba yung pag-iingat. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, the President has given an order for a unified protocol in vaccination. We agree. But in formulating these protocols, all implement, implementing agencies, which in this case are the LGUs, must be represented. On the bloody drug war, public safety and impunity. Madam Speaker, distinguished colleagues, the Philippines is relatively more peaceful now than what it was five or six years ago. The relentless anti-illegal drugs campaign of the 30th administration has succeeded in reducing the drug menace and consequently lowered the crime rate. 
authorities has busted thousands of drug peddlers. And there are no more changi from where patrons used to buy the illegal substance called shabo. More so, the aggressive crackdown on illegal drug trade had greatly minimized the then emerging problem of narco politics. The campaign was able to neutralize politicians and big time personalities, including nine generals, police generals, as mentioned by the president, allegedly involved in illegal drugs. But, Madam Speaker, distinguished colleagues, impunity and police abuses have turned out to be the downsides of the bloody drug war. In several instances, policemen went beyond the limits of their authority and obviously misused the power they willed. The tragic death of 17-year-old Gian de los Santos in August 16, 2017, who was killed near his home in Caloacan City, was a clear proof of police brutality. The crime was caught on a closed-circuit television and the recorded video showed policemen dragging the kid through the street and shooting him, although officers initially said the victim shot at them and they were merely defending themselves. The case of the Los Santos was only one of the thousands of non unbanned stories put forth by the police after every deadly operations. Justice Secretary Minardo Guevara had admitted before the members of the United Nations Human Rights Council that the police had failed to follow protocols in thousands of drug-related deaths which include the examination of the guns recovered in operations. Ivara's admission has given credence to the June 2020 report by the Office of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, claiming that police officers planted guns in cases when suspects allegedly resisted arrest. Guns with the same serial numbers were found at two or more crime scenes, suggesting they were planted by police officers and used multiple times, the report further claimed. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, an immediate review by the Justice Department of all cases involving non-Laban suspects is necessary, not to discredit the ongoing drug campaign, nor undermine the heroic deeds of our good policemen, but to give justice to the victims of frame up and their families. Mabuti na lamang at may nakuha ng CCTV ang nangyari kay Kian. Dahil ito ang naging malakas na ebidensya para madiin ang mga polis nasangkot sa krimen. Video din naging viral sa social media ang nagdiin kay Police Senior Master Sergeant Junel Nyuska na siyang bumaril at pumatay sa maginang Sonia at Frank Gregorio ng bayan ng Paniki Tarlac. Ganon din ang nangyari sa kaso Nelelebet Galbes ng Quezon City na hinila sa buhok at sa kabinaril sa liig ni, Buli, ni Police Master Sergeant Hense Sinampan. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, there have been numerous complaints about police abuses which were not caught on camera. Though several of these cases were not drug-related, the fact that it involved policemen allegedly, allegedly taking advantage of their authority is quite alarming. The drug war did not only breed impunity, 
but also mirrored the lack of coordination and competition, competition among our law enforcement agencies. The mis-encounter between members of the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency and the police that killed three operatives and a civilian at Commonwealth Avenue, Quezon City, in February 24, 2021, and the near misencounter encounter between the same groups last May 14, also in Quezon City, were strong indications of miscommunication and co uncoordinated op operations. While the problem has already been fixed, as PDEA and PNP has claimed, it's clear that the police failed to follow protocols since PIDEA is the lead agency in anti-illegal drug campaign. Madam Speaker, Your Honours, the Philippine National Police is among the most favored uniform personnel of this administration, with increase in salary and other benefits. Public expect them to pay back through honest and dedicated law enforcement work. Ang karagdagang sweldo para sa mga kapulisan ay suklian ng magandang serbisyo. The President has asked Congress to pass a law extending free legal assistance to PNP personnel. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, we can support it only for good cops, but it poses a danger of promoting impunity among bad cops. A lengthy debate on this proposal is expected, Madam Speaker. On food security and agriculture industry, our food security program is in danger. The spike in inflation, inflation rate, and the African swine fever outbreak in the Philippines have made food products, especially rice and pork, more expensive in the local market. This is the poor state of our agriculture industry, which makes survival even more difficult for our farmers and working class Filipinos amid the pandemic. The government had tried but failed to decrease, decrease retail prices of pork due to scarcity of supply, brought about by the rapidly in rising incidence of ASF in the country despite the increased volume of imports. While the higher volume of rice importation had succeeded in maintaining rice prices, it was proven to detrimental to the interests of our farmers. On May 10, 2021, President Rodrigo Duterte signed Proclamation 1143, declaring a state of calamity throughout the Philippines due to African swine fever outbreak. With one year effectivity as ASF, has spread into regions, 46 provinces, 502 cities and municipalities, and 2,652 barangays. On the same day, the President issued Executive Order 133 that increased the minimum access volume for pork importation to address the shortage of supply. This was followed by Executive Order 134, which the President signed on May 15, modifying or lowering the import duty on fresh, chilled, or frozen meat upon the recommendation of the NEDA. However, as of July 20, 2021, as per price monitoring report of the Department of Agriculture, the prevailing retail prices of pork have remained high at 340 pesos to 370 pesos per kilo. 
slightly lower than May 14 prices of the same products at 350 to 380. Ironically, Madam Speaker, Your Honours, while the country is under state of calamity due to ASF, the President allowed to increase the volume of meat importation, which was earlier pinpointed as the cause of the spread of the virus in the Philippines. According to Agriculture Secretary William Dar, the ESF outbreak originated from the meat that was imported from China. Their statement was used by a group of local hog hazers in filing draft charges against him for its failure to implement sufficient meat inspection facilities and border control for a coming pork supply that contributed to the spread of the ESF disease and disrupted the Philippine market. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, it appears that the increased MAF in EO133 and the lower tariff in EO134 only guarantee a full year of steady profit for importers and traders at the expense of the Filipino consumers and livestock raisers. Both EO133 and EO134 for imported pork have worked hand in hand in favoring the importers instead of helping our local producers to fill the gap of the shortage while gaining a sustainable income to survive. In addition, the Department of Finance stated that with EU-134, the government lost 1.35 billion pesos in less than two months and could climb up to 11.2 billion at the end of the year. Madam Speaker, Your Honours, the country is also losing millions of pesos in income due to lower tariff on rice. The lower, lowering of import duties for most favored nations from 40 to 50 percent down to 35 percent for one year, as mandated in EO 135, will cost the government about 231 million to 7 140 million pesos in lost revenues this year, according to the DOF. Reducing the tariff for most favored nations for the purpose of diversifying our market resources is illogical because our traditional sources of imported rice are also the most favored nations. On May 14, after the day, a day up before EO135 was signed by the President, rice prices ranged from 38 pesos to 50 pesos for local varieties and from 44 to 50, 52 pesos for imported products as per DA price monitoring report. The DA data, data on July 22, 2021, showed that EO-135 failed to bring down the prices of rice. It also strengthened the claim of our distinguished colleague, Magsasaka Party List, Ref Argel Joseph Kabatbat, who through House Resolution 1783 pushed for the revocation of EO-135. Mr. Speaker, Your Honours, sustainable agriculture and self-sufficiency have always been our government's goal. But EOS 133, 134, and 135 are exactly the opposite, indicating our dependence on importation as a way to address food shortage. They serve as a proof of failure to achieve our sustainability goals. 
Paliwanag pa po sa sikat ng araw na mali ang tinatahak nating landas. On crisis in education, among the hardest hit by the pandemic is the education sector. The crisis did not only cripple the economy, but also further weakened our educational system. Madam Speaker, my esteemed colleagues, the poor state of our basic education program is a painful reality. The erroneous learning modules distributed to students and their lack of gadgets for online instruction under the distance learning scheme had worsened the already deteriorating standard of education in the country. Wrong spelling and grammar, incorrect mathematical equation, and impossible task are among the more than 150 modular errors that officials of the Department of Education had confirmed to have been validated as they vowed to correct the mistakes during the hearing conducted by House Committee on Public Account, Account Shared by Rep. Singson, held last June 14. The gravest of these errors was found in a learning material reportedly distributed to grade 10 students in Pampanga, where the word as one was described as a sex-crazed creature rather than a winged cannibal or monster as depicted in Filipino folklore. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, while mistakes can be corrected, the problem is that the damage had already been done. Textbooks known, modules na ngayon, ngunit ang pagkakamali ay palaging naroon. This act is tantamount to grave neglect of duty on the part of the DepEd personnel in charge for the content and publication of these erroneous learning materials. It's not surprising to see the Philippines at the tail end in the results of multi-country studies in the performance of our elementary and high school students. The test results of the Program for International Student Assessment, or PESA, the Trends International Mathematics and Science Study, and the Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metrics, which were conducted from 2018 to 2019 or before the pandemic, per proof of the sinking value of Philippine education. Ayon sa PESA, ang mga aral na Pinoy, ang may pinakahina sa labing pitot siyam na bansa sa pag-intindi, nagbinabasa, o reading comprehension, kamantala lumabas naman sa pag-aaral na ginawa ng TEMS, na sa libang lima, walo mga bansa, pinakahuli ang Pilipinas sa matematika at agam para sa bata na nasa ikaapat na baitang. This is the state of our public education, a stark contrast to the TEPED's budget, which is the highest every year in the General Appropriations Act. Madam Speaker, Your Honors, May pandemya wala na masamang nasama-samang kalagayan ng sektor ng edukasyon sa Pilipinas. Our inability to prepare and adapt an effective distance learning scheme in lieu of in-person classes has further worsened the level of public education in the country. On infrastructure, the COVID-19 pandemic has also taken its toll on the country's infrastructure development program. Already plagued by serious delays in the implementation due to several factors, including lack of technology, right-of-way acquisition problems, poor project preparation and identification, technical capacity deficit and procurement problems, the government's infrastructure program was further delayed by the adverse effects of the pandemic. Madam Speaker, my esteemed colleagues, the President heralded accomplishment of his administrations in terms of infrastructure development, 
including the DPWH and the DOTR. But sadly and truthfully, the President admitted the failure to rebuild Marawi City. He even called upon the Task Force Bangon Marawi to race against time and finish the construction works. Even the much touted Build Build Bid program was badly hit by the crisis, and the long standing infrastructure backlog in the country has worsened. This is the current state of public infrastructure in the Philippines. Now, with only one year left in the President Duterte's term, it's becoming clearer that more than half of the BBB projects will be left un uncompleted, if not unimplemented, by June 30, 2020, 2022. On May 12, 2020, the NEDA approved the revised list of IFPs from 75 to 112. Of these projects, four have been completed. 29 projects to be completed next year, and the rest are expected to be completed by 2023 and beyond. Presidential Advisor for Flagship Programs and Projects Vince Dizon said that while BBB continue to make progress, it is also setting up the foundation in terms of infrastructure for the next administration and beyond. Ang tanong, ipagpapatuloy kaya ng susunod na Pangulo ang mga iwanang proyekto na ngayong administrasyon? The next administration will have the option of either to continue implementing the BBB listed project or simply scrap it. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, other than the political uncertainty and question of continuity, another serious problem hampering our development is the inequitable distribution of government resources. The National Capital Region has been getting more projects and bigger allocation than the rest of the country. The data from the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department showed that as of March 2019, National Capital Region got a 23% share of the total budget for BBB, while other regions got less than 5% each, except for Region 3 with 5.32%. The same document claimed that for multi-regional priority projects, Luzon got a share of 39.5% as compared to the 4% shares of Visayas and Mindanao, respectively. Madam Speaker, distinguished colleagues, under the funds for infrastructure in 2021, General General Appropriations Act. Visayas got only 6%, while Mindanao got 9%, and the rest went to NCR and Luzon. Imagine that, Mr. Madam Speaker, Your Honors, that is far from being equitable. It has been the situation before this administration and still the situation today. It is very glaring that having a Mindanaoan president did not tilt the balance in favor of the provinces. Imperial Manila is very much alive. On peace and internal conflict, it is peace with Muslim secessionists, but war against the communist rebels. It was, it is a winsome, lose situation for the Philippines 
peace initiatives. The negotiation with the secessionist groups in southern Philippines have paved the way for the establishment of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. On the other hand, peace talk with the Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, National Democratic Front failed to progress. The termination of talks with the CPP and PNDF had pushed the government to create the National Task Force to end local communist armed conflict, as it encouraged localized peace talks purposely to neutralize the commun communist insurgents. In pursuit of lasting peace, on February 5, 2021, President Duterte signed Proclamation Numbers 1090, 1091, 1092, and 1093 granting amnesty to members of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, Moro National Liberation Front, Revolutionary Partido ng Manggagawa ng Pilipinas, Revolutionary Proletarian Army Alex Bunkayo Brigade, and former rebels of the communist terrorist group who have committed crimes punishable under the Revised Penal Code and Special Penal Laws in furtherance of their political beliefs. On May 19, the House of Representatives concurred with the good intent of the said proclamations through the approval of House Concurrent Resolutions Numbers 12, 13, 14, and 15. Definitely, the grant of amnesty to former rebels will promote an atmosphere conducive to peace and reconciliation. However, both the BARM and NTF LCAC are now facing controversies other than budgetary issues. Several groups have demanded transparency in the use or disbursement of funds appropriated and released to the two entities. BARM has a combined 160 billion budget for fiscal year 2020 and 2021, while NTFLCAC has been allocated almost 19.1 billion pesos for the same period. Madam Speaker, Your Honours, the success of or failure of the government's peace efforts will depend upon the implementation of the peace agreements. The request of the BARM administration to postpone election on May 2022 is evidential proof of the slow pace normalization process in Muslim Mindanao. While the president made mention of the Bangsa Moro Organic Law as a measure to correct historical injustice, he failed to announce his position on the pending bills extending the transition period of the BARM. Madam Speaker, distinguished colleagues, we are now in a quandary as what truly is the President's stand on the matter by not mentioning the proposed extension is he not supporting the postponement? The question here, Madam Speaker, Your Honours, is not about the law, but on how the law is being implemented. It is also not about the money, but how funds are utilized for the benefit of the people. As they say, Salos Popule Supreme Lex, the welfare of the people is the supreme law. On foreign policy, they call it independent. We call it inconsistent. Our foreign, foreign policy is baffling. The inconsistent and confusing decisions made by the Duterte administration has to put question the country's diplomatic principles and 
foreign policy direction. While the government has been trumpeting its so-called independent foreign policy, it flip-flopped in critical issues, particularly on the West Philippine Sea claim. His speech last year, President Duterte thanked other countries for supporting the tribunal decision that invalidated China's claim, including the areas within the Philippine exclusive economic zone that our government refers to as the West Philippine Sea. Malacanang claimed that while President Duterte regards China as a close friend, his position on the West Philippines dispute will not waver. In line with this commitment, the Department of Foreign Affairs has filed 83 diplomatic protests against China during this administration. However, in an ironic twist of fate, the president, the president recently downplayed the arbitral ruling by calling it a piece of paper that can be thrown in the wastebasket a 180 degree turn from his previous statement. Meanwhile, the controversial visiting forces agreement with the United States is supposed to expire next month of August, but the president has extended the deal for another six months. This is the third extension given by the president after he unilaterally decided to terminate the pact on February 11, 2020. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, we, ha we need to have a clear-cut and consistent foreign policy. In several instances, the DFN Malacanang had issued conflicting statements of the Philippine-U.S. relations that only added to the public confusion about our foreign policy direction. And while we appear to be nurturing our relationship with China and Russia, we are slowly driving away our longtime ally, which is the United States. To conclude, Madam Speaker, Your Honors, as I have said, our country is in a very bad shape. We need to act on the problems swiftly. On the pandemic response, Filipinos need not to choose to die in hunger or the virus. Amid the pandemic, a balance between health and economy must be maintained. Dapat bigyan Ang bawat Pilipino ng pantay na oportunidad na babakunahan, inequitable distribution of vaccines must be corrected soonest. I call on the Department of Health to change its strategy on the vaccination program from where the source is to vaccine to population ratio. The presence of the Delta variant in the country calls for a more proactive response, particularly to specific targeted mass testing in the community in order to generate relevant and accurate data. I also call on the ITF to conduct consultations with concerned LGUs prior to the imposition of lockdowns in order to avoid resistance to the order. The LGUs know better than the National Task Force as to the exact situation on the ground. On the drug war, I call on the President I call the PNP chief to immediately conduct an investigation on the allegation 
of illegal drugs involvement of nine generals as highlighted in the sauna of the president. I also call on the PNP hierarchy to instill discipline among its ranks to eliminate impunity. The police must strictly observe protocols in anti-illegal drug operation and must recognize and respect PDEA's leadership. On food security and agriculture, Mr. President, ang sabi niyo po, bigyan ng dalawang buwan itong EOS 133-134 at 135. Tumampas na po sa dalawang buwan. Nalugi na po ang gobyerno. Ngunit di naman po nagbinipisyo ang publiko. Maybe it's time to revoke this EOS. Father, Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, I call on the leadership of Congress to immediately convene the Congressional Oversight Committee to evaluate the utilization of the Rice Competitiveness Enhance, en Enhancement Fund or the RCEF. I also call on the Bureau of Customs to publish collections on rice tariff. On education, people committing grave offenses must not be left unpunished. The erroneous learning materials were proof of negligence and dereliction of duty. I call on the DepEd officials to identify the culprits bring them to court, and have them penalized under our laws. To the LGUs, it is time to refocus our trust by utilizing available budget, particularly the Special Education Fund or the CEF, for the procurement of digital infrastructure that will help the teachers and students adjust to the distance learning scheme. On infrastructure, infrastructure projects must be implemented and completed regardless who will become the next president. The principle of con continuity must reign supreme so that political differences will not impede development. I call on the officials of the Department of Public Works and Highways, leaders of Congress, and government planners, and implementers, to put a stop to the decades-old tradition of investing and spending more in Metro Manila. There should be equitable distribution of government resources in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. If I may quote the President, I ask the Task Force Bangon Marawi to expedite rehabilitation of the one torn city. We have, ra we have to race against time. And so, I call on the Chairman of the Task Force Bangon Marawi to shape up or ship out. On peace and internal conflict, thank you, Mr. President, for persistently pursuing through the BOL and amnesty proclamation to complete the correction of historical injustice. The President must ensure that the government fulfills its commitments in the normalization track of the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro. Pursuant to our oversight function, Congress must demand reports from the BARM and OPA officials on the disbursement of funds, especially the BRAC.
the block grant. The same report must be must also be submitted to Congress on the use of the NTF LCAC budget. On foreign policy, an independent foreign policy is ideal, but consistency is necessary. I call on the President to make a concrete and clear stand on the issue involving the arbitral tribunal ruling. On the Visiting Forces Agreement, the tactical value of extension has been spent. Mr. President, the time has arrived to decide whether to abrogate or sign an amended Visiting Forces Agreement advantages to the Filipino people. Finally, I call on go all government officials and employees to unite under a single-minded duty of providing a secure, prosperous, and dignified life for all. Thank you, Ms. Spe Madam Speaker, my esteemed colleagues. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Thank you. Thank you, Minority Leader Joseph Paduano of Abang Lingkod Party List for that extensive contrasona.